Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Today, I have the rare opportunity to speak to an expert on the Horn of Africa who's both from the region and has a strong leftist background, Abdurrahman Muhammad Ahmed. While it's not often in the news, as Abdurrahman will help us understand, uh, the Horn of Africa is a volatile region, often the scene of violence, and its countries are victims of international interventions and interference that has played a destabilizing role. So, Abdurrahman, to the audience who isn't familiar with the Horn of Africa, can you begin by explaining the countries that make up the Horn of Africa, and we can go from there? Uh, first of all, hi, Rania. Uh, thank <laughs> you for inviting me in your amazing uh, uh, broadcasting. Uh, and allow me also to say uh, to a lot of brothers and sisters that I have in, in, in Palestine, uh, congratulations for, for your last victory. Uh, and we are, we are continuing to be with you, uh, standing with you in solidarity. Uh, I uh, worked and I lived in Gaza uh, for more than oh. four years, as well in occupied uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so I was really uh, following uh, carefully what was going on. And, and it was, as uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said, it was actually a second Eid uh, with their victory. Um, Concerning your questions, when it comes to the Horn of Africa, uh, the Horn of Africa uh, it's comprised of, uh, if we can say, about eight countries. Uh, we can start with Eritrea, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, then uh, Kenya, Somalia, and then Djibouti. Uh, it's a region that is strategically located, specifically when it comes to uh, the Bab el Mandab. Uh, it's one of the most important uh, maritime roads uh, for the international uh, trade. Uh, also, when it comes to energy, because uh, most of the, the, the oil cargoes actually passing through Bab el Mandab. So that's why actually this region is uh, uh, very important. And there, there has been a lot of things going on uh, during the last uh, 10, 15, or maybe 20 years. Uh, and usually this region doesn't make often when it comes to the, the, the international news. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have, for example, Djibouti, which is a very small country, 21,000 square uh, kilometer. Uh, but then you have actually uh, the highest, uh, uh, largest number of foreign uh, military base. Uh, the only US uh, military base in the whole African continent, as well as the first Chinese military base but you have also the, the, the longest, actually, uh, foreign presence, foreign military presence by the French, who used to be the, 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 uh, the ancient uh, colonizer of uh, Djibouti. Uh, and then you have, like, Japan. You have uh, many other countries, like Italy, Spain, uh, Danish, as well as uh, a, a strong presence from the, some, some Gulf countries, backyard countries like uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, and, and, and others. Back to you. That's very, no, no, that's a very good explanation. Why don't we go into, um, wh where are you now? Where are you actually speaking to us from? Uh, actually, I cannot uh, specify the, the uh, where I am, location. but I am in Somalia. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 yeah, I cannot specify the location for, for security reason, but I'm in Somalia. And we can actually, get into and, that. And the blue I'm wearing, the, the blue yes. I'm wearing, actually, it's not the, the, the Zionist color, actually. This is the flag of Somalia. <laughs> I'm actually wearing blue, too, and I don't mean to be, yes. be in that color either. <laughs> but that, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, can you, I guess, before we get started on speaking more broadly about the region, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, you were involved in student activism in Canada before returning home. So what's your background? Uh, my background, actually, I grew up in uh, one of, I, I say it actually, one of the best cities in, in, in Canada, Montreal. Uh, and Montreal is well known for, for, for its uh, social activism. Uh, and while I was actually doing my uh, university uh, studies there, uh, we, we set up with uh, a lot of actually other activists. We set up uh, uh, SPHR, Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights. That was actually the... the uh, uh, the, the first student uh, grassroots-based 
uh, organization uh, that ever defeated the, 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 the Zionist organization in Canada. Mm -hmm. so, so that was really amazing. Uh, and I was also involved when it comes to, because my background is international finance and economics, so I was involved in anti-globalization uh, 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 struggle. Uh, there have been a couple of documentary that was made, but one of the the most one is uh, uh, Salami uh, uh, Life Before Profit. Uh, uh, that was actually a, the, the, was a defining moment before uh, the event in uh, September against the WTO. Uh, what we did was actually uh, a year before what happened in Seattle in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Rania. Hey, you're back. Yes, yeah, sorry, my because of the heat, my phone actually got uh, oh, uh, so too much heat. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's overheated, and then I have now I have to go under the the shadow of some some of the okay. trees that I'm going okay. up here. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's let's continue where we were. So we were talking about your background in activism. I wanted to know, like, did yes. your former activism influence your work in Africa, or the uh, other way yes, around? Yes, actually, maybe? then. Mm -hmm. uh, when 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 I graduated from from uh, uh, in Canada, uh, my first uh, posting or job was actually to go. Oop! The audio the audio went away. Hang on, hang on. Can you hear me? I think the audio came out. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can ah, you hear me now? Yeah. Let's try and find a way so, to stabilize. Wait, hold on. Before we continue so that it doesn't keep falling, let's try to find a way to perfect. stabilize your phone. Is there something you can, like, lean it against so you don't have to hold uh, it? I, I think now now, now, now it's okay. Um, okay. You're, it's okay? So, so I was saying uh, uh, after Canada, actually, I was based in, in, in occupied Palestine where I stayed for years. Then... Uh, it was between 2003 until 2007. Uh, and then I decided actually to come back in Africa. Uh, I wasn't happy actually working with a lot of uh, hypocrisy, uh, especially mm -hmm. when it come uh, the position of Canada. Uh, then um, I, I came back in Africa where I worked on environmental issues because uh, climate change is actually uh, definitely a real issue here. Maybe in some other countries, people are talking about the effect of climate change, but here you can see uh, you can see it daily uh, in the life of the people, uh, and it's impacting a lot of women and children. So I work at the last uh, uh, six, seven years on environmental issues, uh, uh, trying to promote uh, a totally African uh, developed solution or African solution centered uh, with a lot of African innovation because. Um, we're still facing this imperialistic uh, intervention, even when it comes to climate change. Uh, while actually people actually lived here a thousand years and they know how to actually find solution uh, that better answer to their problem, they, with the problem they are facing. So yes, now the last 10 years I am in Africa. I travel actually in all the country that I mentioned uh, and I work at with all these countries uh, in the Horn of Africa, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, where I was based six years, uh, Kenya, uh, Somalia, Djibouti, uh, and Eritrea. That's that's good to know your background. You are also, you're from Djibouti, you're Djiboutian, right? Is that how I pronounce it? Djiboutian? Yes, yes. Okay. Djiboutian, yeah. Can, yeah. Can you, you mentioned a little bit about Djibouti earlier. Can you tell us the, about the nature of the government there and about Djibouti's role in international affairs? You mentioned it's been used as a military base by various countries. Yes. Uh, uh, Djibouti is actually what we can define as a, as a garrison uh, country. And that actually can already tell uh, to all the viewers of uh, Breakthrough News uh, what kind of actually uh, governance we have there because you know western imperialism they don't like actually democracy or the will of the people so we have the same uh, family uh, who's running the show during the last 44 years uh, the first one actually uh, since the, the, the independence and then he ruled the country uh, with an iron fist almost more than 20 years and then his nephew replaced him 
And actually, he was uh, recently, he organized a fake election uh, without all this uh, Western uh, military base saying anything when it comes to democracy. And then, then they, they, uh, they just applauded. And then he was re-elected uh, a fifth term. Uh, and they lack that kind of uh, governance where the will of the people are not respected, neither the human right or the, the dignity of the people, but where you have a strong uh, man, even if that strong man is actually an old guy, totally fossilized, uh, mm. uh, and he can do nothing. So total corruption. But it seems that actually these foreign uh, uh, countries who are back in the regime in Djibouti are happy with that. Mm. And you mentioned the... Um the we know we talked about the u.s military base there but what's the gulf role the gulf states the arab gulf states they have a role in djibouti can you describe that yes uh the 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 let's say the 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 gulf uh, regimes uh, specifically saudi arabia uh it's the the fi financer of the the djibouti budget because mm -hmm. um uh, they are actually giving a lot of money to the regime of Djibouti. Uh, we know also actually that they, they, uh, they pay a lot of money to the US government. So uh, uh, it's, it looks like a, just like a, a, a free bank for the Western uh, imperialism. And actually, I'm sure that actually it's the American who told them actually to pay the, the, the money that serve as a salary of, 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 for, the, for Djibouti. Uh, and their interest is actually the same one uh, of their master, which is the, the American, it's actually to control uh, the, the Babel Mandab. Uh, and at the same time, on the other side of Djibouti, you have Yemen, who is refused actually to, to submit to, to, to that dictate. And, and since the last six years, they have been bombarded. And, uh, and still now, they, 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 they continue to be bombarded. So they, they come back to the American style democracy. So that's the so reality now we are facing. So you, you mentioned you're in Somalia, you can't specify the exact location, but that means you left Djibouti. What yes. happened in Djibouti that forced you to leave? Uh, what happens actually, they don't let you actually uh, organize your life, uh, live your life. So when I came back to Djibouti, the first thing I did was actually to create my own things, a small consultancy firm. And then with the money that actually I was uh, uh, gaining from, from, from that work, I was actually part of that money. I was reinvesting uh, into different youth programs. I created actually the first uh, youth cooperative in Djibouti, uh, uh, taking experience from my, my, my life in Quebec, in Canada, uh, where cooperative uh, 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 is, is a strong thing actually uh, there. So... Uh, I started actually organizing the youth into cooperative, but also the idea behind cooperative is actually people learn uh, the value of democracy because when you are in a cooperative model, uh, uh, you don't have the same model that usually work within the big corporation that we are facing today when it comes to uh, uh, the globalization. Uh, it's mm -hmm. actually the, the will of everyone uh, before taking any decision. Uh, and the whole idea was actually this youth will learn uh, uh, this value in terms of democracy, in terms of discussion, uh, in terms of consultancy, and then they will organize themselves actually asking for more rights. But actually the, the, the dictatorial regime was most, uh, more fast than them and actually they understood uh, uh, the, what I, I had in mind. And then, then uh, I faced a lot of problems. First thing, uh, they, they shut down my, 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 my business. Uh, my social business, and then uh, they blocked my uh, bank uh, account. And then after that, actually, it grew up in terms of uh, the pressure, and I started facing a lot of uh, physical trade. That's when I decided wow. to leave. Wow. So what do you expect to happen in Djibouti? Do you think anything will change, or it will just stay the same way? No, things are changing. Uh, Alhamdulillah, things are changing. People are becoming more aware of the situation. Uh, and uh, people are becoming also aware of the this huge uh, propaganda that used to make them actually live in fear. Exactly the same way, actually, when I was in in, in Canada, when the the people usually uh, uh, used to to be in, to live in fear when it comes to the issue 
of occupied Palestine. And, and then mm. you have all these Zionist lobbies saying, oh, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism. And then they used to say, oh, this is too complicated. We're not going to get involved. Mm. So the same kind of fear uh, 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 I, I actually faced in Djibouti. But uh, Alhamdulillah, again, people are organizing uh, women, youth uh, inside Djibouti, uh, but also the diaspora who are living. Uh, a huge part of the Djiboutian people, uh, people actually left the country they are living in the uh, in different country and they they, they organize themselves so uh, yes soon soon things will 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 move hopefully in the right direction well can i ask you what what made you go because you went to school in montreal which you talked about your activism there what made you go back to djibouti and and become active in your home country what drove you to do that uh good questions um, um when when actually i went to Canada, uh, it was in a relation with something that happened in Djibouti. It was uh, the years uh, uh, 1991. And at that moment, um, uh, there was the first uh, armed uh, uh, rebellion started in Djibouti. Uh, and, and my family knowing me, uh, uh, they actually thought that it was best for me to join uh, part of my other family that was living in Canada. Uh, so it was a kind of actually uh, my family who decided to ban me from Djibouti. Oh. So when I went there, uh, yeah. <laughs> and when I went there, actually, my, my, my objective was always actually to learn, to, to finish my study, to learn things uh, in terms of solidarity and all that, and then come back to my country. But uh, I never to let uh, myself being part of the African continent biggest problem of today, which is actually uh, the people who are born in, in different country in Africa are today in front of the dictatorship that are living. Uh, for me, uh, that was not an option. Uh, uh, yes, I can be banished for, for a, a, a certain period of time, but then, then come back with, with, with more arms. Uh, I'm talking about intellectual arms. So then, then we can actually be the change we would like to see in our countries in Africa. Now, you also have worked in Ethiopia. Um, can you explain why the country suddenly appears to be descending into civil war? And are outside actors involved in propelling this uh, yes. violence? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, Ethiopia, uh, the last uh, 27, 29 years, uh, uh, you was actually kind of like the cherished uh, baby of the Western imperialism. Uh, and Ethiopia was actually used as a proxy for Western, uh, uh, Western intervention when it comes to the Horn of Africa. Uh, when, when you go back uh, uh, and look into the history, during that same period, the people who was in power was the TPLF, the Tigray uh, People Liberation Front. Uh, it's true. At the beginning, the TPLF was a, a, a democracy-seeking uh, liberation front, uh, and they overthrew a, a, a even worse dictatorship, the one of Mengistu Hale Mariam, who killed uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. But then TPLF, when they stayed uh, for almost three decades in power, they became worse than what actually they were fighting. Uh, and then they, they become actually a proxy. In exchange, they received billions of dollar in terms of support, in terms of arms and everything. So, so um, what happened was actually uh, uh, there has been a, a, an uprising by one of the biggest group in Ethiopia, uh, namely the Oromo, uh, and namely also the youth, totally nonviolent, and they overthrow this TPLF regime. Uh, but the problem is actually Ethiopia is facing, and 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 we again we are in the same propaganda when the Westerns. Imperialists, they lose one of their proxy, then they start their their the whole uh, media propaganda saying, "Oh, Ethiopia is sending into into civil war. Ethiopia is becoming dictatorship," which is not true. Actually, the, because of what happened in Ethiopia, now the, there is a bigger chance in terms of peace and prosperity when it comes to the Horn of Africa. And you can see it actually when when the new leadership came. First thing they did was actually to make peace with Eritrea, uh, and then also then to make peace with with. Uh, uh, Somalia. So mm -hmm. now we have these three countries, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, who are actually on the front, actually pushing uh, the, the democracy agenda. 
And then oh. against that, you have like a huge, huge, powerful propaganda machine saying, oh, no, Ethiopia is descending into, into a dictatorship. And then Somalia is actually, there is a problems going on. Eritrea, we are not talking about, but they are happy with what's going on in Djibouti. They are happy actually with the corruption going on in Kenya. The irony, of course, of Western imperialism. The irony, yeah. Um, you've also worked in Somalia. Can you explain why Somalia is... A going through this electoral crisis and why there was a sudden increase in violence there? Uh, again, uh, it's really, and, and that's why I would like to really benefit your, 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 uh, the people who are actually watching the, the show. Um, uh, what's actually going on, uh, on, on in the field and what, what, what has been reported by uh, Western uh, media is totally uh, let's say, from earth to the moon. Um, in Somalia, you have, for the first time, a government uh, that actually is not corrupt, that has the backing of a huge, huge, huge um, uh, a majority of the people, and that a government who would like, actually, to implement uh, uh, um, true democracy, meaning one person, one vote. Because in Somalia, when Somalia was in... in, in um, Actually, in, in the civil war, um, Ethiopia was used, as I said, as a proxy. And Ethiopia and Djibouti were the two proxies that were used into the reconciliation of Somalia. And they established in the provisional constitution a totally, totally uh, uh, unjust uh, system based on clan 4.5, meaning actually the different clans, but also 0.5 meaning actually part of the Somali people were not even recognized as human being. They were recognized as uh, half of a human being. And that system is the system supported by the Western democracy uh, 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 today. On the other side, you have a government who would like to implement one person, one vote. And they got nuts crazy. And you have like every day, the American ambassador in Somalia, the, uh, 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 the UK, uh, uh, ambassador of Somalia actually uh, decrying actually and you have uh, huge millions coming from, from uh, Emirates uh, coming, uh, pouring and then uh, uh, helping actually like uh, uh, ignite uh, some kind of a civil wars. But all, things, all these things are not happening until now because again, mm -hmm. people actually started to wake up. So if we zoom out a little bit at the region as a whole, and you mentioned the Emirates. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the different foreign interventions from Djibouti to Somalia and elsewhere and how they've destabilized the region um, and how as the recent activist role played by the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Qatar, how that's changed the dynamics? Um, actually, uh, yes, uh, Emirates is actually one of the most uh, um, um, let's say, involved into the destabilization into the country of uh, Horn of Africa. Uh, one of the, the main reasons being actually, they would like to protect their, their economical interest. Uh, Emirates know actually that if there is a peace in the Horn of Africa countries, there will be no more about the DP world uh, and all this logistical hub that they build their, 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 their country. So, so they have to actually uh, uh, play uh, a big role when it comes to destabilizing the region so they can continue profiting from what's uh, 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 a, a divided uh, uh, um, uh, region, let's say in the Horn of Africa. Uh, the the, the uh, Emirates also is playing another uh, role. Uh, I mentioned actually Yemen, uh, mm -hmm. and you know that actually in South Yemen, uh, uh, the Emirates actually are occupying South Yemen. And I would like to actually to, to mention for the benefits of your uh, viewers that actually there is a big island called Socotra. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, when the Emirates came, actually they took that island. Uh, they wanted to build a, a, a military base because it's on the, the Indian Oceans uh, and going to the Red Sea, very strategic. Uh, but they didn't do that. What they did first, they, they did a totally uh, 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 shameful environmental crimes. 
uh, because in that small island uh, uh, there was only some some of the the last kind of trees um, I don't know the terms but uh, it's called mandragores and and usually uh, they, they, uh, they you cannot find it in other places it's uh, totally a, a uh, 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 endangered species of trees. So they, they uprooted these trees and they start selling it. Uh, and I, I just actually, like when, I, when I, I heard that, actually, it reminded me how when I was in occupied Palestine, the Zionists was, were, were doing the same thing where they're uprooting the olive trees and then selling it $10,000, $15,000 to, to other yeah. countries. So Emirates actually just copying the same, same intervention. Speaking of the Israelis, is there an Israeli role in the Ethiopian conflict or other regional developments in the Horn of Africa? Yes, 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 yes. Actually, uh, Israelis are uh, heavily involved with uh, what's going on in Ethiopia. Uh, and not now, uh, uh, since, since uh, uh, a long time. Uh, and then, then, then they used to be also involved at the beginning with the uh, in Eritrea, where they built their first uh, spying bases uh, in Eritrea. But then the, the the government there actually, when they saw their destabilizing role, they kicked them out. Uh, and now actually, it looks like actually also there are present in Djibouti. Uh, but even if there are not present in Djibouti, the same model of actually creating uh, a totally uh, foreign uh, colony in, in Arab lands. The same thing is also happening with Djibouti. Djibouti today with all these foreign military base is used as the, 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 the proxy to continue actually the destabilization uh, into the Horn region. And um... No, that's really uh, interesting. We never hear about that here in the U.S. Another development um, is the role you mentioned the Emirates. You've talked about Israel. Um, and then there's also, of course, the Qataris. And you mentioned the Saudis as well. But then there's this yes. new development of the role of a more activist Turkey in Somalia. Um, can you discuss that? And is Turkey involved elsewhere in the region? Um, actually, Turkey actually tried to to be to come back in the, into the region because uh, historically uh, the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire, if we can say, or the Ottoman also Ottoman Sultanate, they used to be present into this region uh, for for centuries uh, in Djibouti as well in Somalia. Uh, the whole the, that whole coastline. The Ottoman used to be present. So when the Sultan Erdogan, as I call him, actually uh, uh, wanted to come back, he tried actually by 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 offering a lot of economical um, exchange, economic uh, uh, economical based treaties, and all that. Um, I was actually uh, I was invited on the first conference that Erdogan organized in Istanbul uh, for for. Turkey, Africa. And at that moment, he used the example of Djibouti saying, uh, while the Western uh, imperialists, they build a lot of military bases in Djibouti, we would like actually to, to build uh, a, a mutually uh, beneficial uh, economical uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, but uh, then it doesn't work. And then uh, the, the, the regime in Djibouti was pressured to cut the ties with the Turkish. Uh, when it comes to Somalia, uh, the relation uh, is historical, very deep. Uh, uh, Erdogan was the first one actually uh, to come uh, to Mogadishu with his plane. Uh, and then uh, what they offered was actually, um, they didn't do the same mistake actually, uh, the Turkish, what they did in Syria. Uh, in Somalia, actually, they, I think they learned uh, about their mistake maybe uh, in Syria. They, they asked the Somalis and the Somali asked them and say, hey, if you want to, to, to help us, uh, help us build our army. So, yes, we can say that actually when it comes to the Turkish role, it's until now is very beneficial because they are helping rebuild the Somali army. And this army is actually what is actually today. It's um, uh, saving, let's say, um, the, 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 the government. Uh, otherwise, actually, because of the pressure, because of uh, Al-Shabaab, uh, and we know Al-Shabaab, uh, who, who were the, the creator of uh, ISIS, 
and, and Al-Qaeda are the same creator of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So without this uh, strong Somali army, the government couldn't actually uh, uh, stand in his feet and continue the reform uh, needed in Somalia. And, you know, we hear a lot in the U.S. and the kind of the uh, through the lens of the Cold War between China and the U.S. that there's so much Chinese involvement in Africa. So I'm curious, how is the Chinese role perceived in Djibouti or elsewhere in the region vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. role? And how does the emerging Cold War between these two big powers, um, how does that play out on the ground in the Horn of Africa? Um, I, I would like to, to, to answer that by mentioning a, um, um, an anecdote, actually, that happened with me uh, while I was in Djibouti. Mm. Uh, it was two years ago, and uh, the Jimmy Carter Institute actually organized with uh, another big institute uh, or think tank in Beijing. They tried to organize kind of a talk uh, to mm. avoid uh, confrontation in the African continent between the US and the Chinese. Uh, so they did one in the US, they did the second one in Beijing, and the third one was in Djibouti. Uh, and uh, I was actually uh, uh, the only person actually that was not part of the government from the civil society who was invited. And they asked, they asked me actually to make a, 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 a speech. And before my speech, actually, there was a tour. We're doing a tour with the American who came. They were high level, uh, diplomats, uh, military, and all that kind of stuff, and a and, and couple of spy also. Uh, and, uh, and, and I was actually having, I was laughing because it was, it was amazing. I was showing them actually all the things that the Chinese actually built in Djibouti. And it didn't mm -hmm. start yesterday. It started actually the day Djibouti started gaining their, their, their independence, uh, 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 meaning 40 years ago. Uh, they built... Uh, the people palace where people can have like actually concerts and music and they build like so many hospitals, they build so many schools, they build so many roads. And I ask them and I say, guys, uh, Djibouti is a small country and it's the only country who offered you a military base in the whole African continent. Djibouti was bashed because of that at the African Union. Uh, and you are in Djibouti since 19, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 2002. What did you do in Djibouti? Did you build a school? Did you build one road? Did you build like a small clinic? And they were just looking <laughs> at me. So that can maybe just summarize the, 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 this, this uh, uh, fake uh, uh, propaganda when it comes to China uh, versus uh, US uh, in the African continent. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yeah, we also we often hear, you know, China builds things, whereas the U.S. just bombs things, um, which isn't necessarily exactly, untrue. <laughs> um, what about the what about what about the Russian? Is there a Russian role at all, or is that mostly like does Russia mostly neglect this area um, of the world? R Russia used to be present uh, before the Soviet uh, era. Um, uh, I was actually amazed to learn when I was in Ethiopia that the first environmental assessment uh, that was done in Ethiopia was actually more than 130 years ago, and it was done by a team of uh, uh, a Russian uh, uh, geograph and, uh, 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 and other specialists. Uh, same thing actually can go for Somalia and other region, uh, uh, another country in the region. Uh, so now what we are, what, what we, we are uh, witnessing a kind of a beginning because we, we all know that Russia was uh, uh, into uh, rebuilding their own country, their own force. Uh, so now that actually Rush, Russia is actually uh, into their two feet, if we can say it, uh, yes. Uh, and we saw it already at the Security uh, Council, at the UN Security Council, when the US and, and the UK, they try actually to blackmail Somalia. Uh, Russia and China stood uh, like they did also with Syria and they vetoed uh, their intervention. Mm. So yes, we are witnessing a, a, a small yet, but like a, a, a kind of welcome uh, 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 coming back of Russia into the Horn of Africa region. 
And, you know, so we we talked a little bit about the UAE, the Emirates, the UAE, um, the Saudi involvement. There's also the Turkish involvement. And all of these countries obviously are involving themselves in this area as a way to gain power and leverage. Um, I think in some cases, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have tried to use these relationships with these countries to get support for the war in Yemen, which you alluded to. But then there's the issue of Iran, right? Is there yes. are these Gulf countries using their influence in the Horn of Africa as a way yes. to gain power against Iran? And is there any Iranian involvement? Uh, Iranian actually is a Muslim country. It's part of the uh, uh, the Muslim uh, uh, international organization. Uh, so yes, uh, I believe that actually Iran has a more uh, legitimate uh, role and presence into the region than, than actually American or a former colonizer. Uh, so yes, Saudi uh, and the Emirates are using uh, the region uh, as their battle uh, field when it comes to the, the, the Iranian issue. Uh, I remember actually when I was in Djibouti, um, uh, again, when, when you look what Saudi Arabia they did for Djibouti and what Iran did for, for Djibouti. Uh, today, Djibouti has uh, a, one of the most modern, uh, ultra-modern building uh, as a parliament with all the future in terms of uh, technology uh, where actually the, 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 the parliamentary system can actually function. Uh, the problem is actually just the head is totally uh, messed up, so so uh, the parliament actually became just a joke. But that building uh, that cost billions, uh, millions of dollars was a gift from the Islamic Republic of Iran to Djibouti, oh. to the people of Djibouti. Again, Saudi Arabia, what did they do? They just give millions of dollars to a corrupt regimes that end up actually uh, uh, into, into uh, uh, money laundering uh, going back from the country and again buying actually this big uh, villa in, in, in France or, or Switzerland uh, or, or Venice uh, in Italy. So obviously we're talking Definitely. a lot about, about, about a lot of issues related to Western intervention and the intervention of Western allies in, in the Gulf states. So I guess, can you explain, because our audience is mostly American. So why should Americans mm -hmm. care about this? Why should Americans care about uh, their government's involvement in the Horn of Africa? Uh, and why are these interventions so underreported and ignored? Uh, I believe that actually American, the American people, uh, and I have a lot of respect for the American people, but less for, for, for their government, uh, should be uh, worried about what's going on in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Few people know that Ethiopia is the biggest uh, recipient when it comes to the American aid, uh, second to uh, the uh, Zionist entity uh, of Israel. Uh, and the few people also may maybe are not aware that their only uh, military presence in the whole African continent uh, is also in Djibouti, uh, one of the, the, the worst dictatorial regime in the in the in the Horn region, so yes, definitely they should be wary because uh, a lot of the kids here in the Horn uh, are learning actually in the school about actually democracy, uh, liberty, dignity, justice. But when they see the the action of the representative uh, or the elected uh, uh, American. Uh, or, the, the people that the American uh, uh, citizen elected uh, and their action, uh, who often actually equal corruption or, or just bombing. Because uh, another fact maybe that people doesn't know, uh, the Horn region is one of the region actually that receive uh, a lot of uh, uh, drone assassination. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's all this, this action, uh, uh, immoral and just actions actually are done with the, the American uh, people uh, tax. So they should worry and they should, they, 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 they should be more involved. Uh, thanks God, today we have actually uh, the four squad. Uh, and as you know, 
Ilhan Omar is actually from this region. Uh, she's an outspoken uh, voice. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully her voice and, and, and many other people who are actually fighting for, for justice and dignity should be heard. And, you know, you mentioned, um, obviously, Ethiopia. We talked about Somalia. Um, Somalia is also the victim of, you know, regime change wars uh, backed, you know, the U.S. also backed an Ethiopian intervention in 2006. Um, how did these play out? Where Did these destabilize, did these interventions destabilize uh, the countries of Somalia and Ethiopia? Definitely. And, and if maybe if we can also go back in the history, it actually didn't start uh, with the intervention of uh, the Ethiopian regime during the TPLF area. Uh, but actually it go back uh, 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 more than 30 years ago. Uh, and at that moment, uh, Somalia actually was uh, fighting uh, to liberate more other, other African countries uh, from the, the colonialism. And, and, and Somalia was the only country where actually the American uh, uh, and the, the, the Soviet Union joined force and attacked uh, to destroy it. Uh, they didn't destroy it actually military, uh, but uh, through the, the, the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they totally destructured the country. Uh, and then also with a lot of other cover-up operation, uh, that actually uh, was the reason that led to the, the, the collapse of the central government. And today, when the government is trying to come back, uh, still we are facing uh, other cover-up action for regime change in Somalia. As well also now that there has been a change, a positive change in Ethiopia, the same uh, 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 regime change uh, propaganda is going on also again in Ethiopia. Mm. Why, so why? Why so much intervention in these countries? What is so important about them to imperialism? Is it their geographic location? What is it? Um, yes, I will say when it comes to the Horn region, the main uh, aspect, actually, it's uh, uh, the geostrategic position of this country. Uh, again, Somalia, it's one of the, the countries that has the longest coastline, maritime coastline, more than 3,300 kilometers uh, mm -hmm. going on, stretching from the Indian Ocean to the Red Sea. Uh, again, and then Ethiopia, uh, 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 when it comes to, in terms of uh, uh, Ethiopia being the water tower, uh, not only for the whole region, but uh, 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 the, 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 the Niles uh, waters going through Egypt, and you know also like the importance of, of, for Egypt when it comes to, to, to the American, uh, 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 let's say, ideology. Uh, uh, so they, that's why um, this region has to be kept uh, under the, 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 the grip of actually the Western imperialism. Another reason is actually today the Horn is actually an, became an active battleground uh, when it comes to the, on one side, the Western, imperialism and the other side, uh, uh, a lot of this region who would like actually to, to go through a, a, their own development, uh, trying to go uh, to industrialize their country uh, so they, they can move their people from poverty. So, uh, and China is actually offering a lot of uh, help in that. So, so they don't want actually this region to become an example for other parts of Africa where uh, 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 resource, mineral resource actually are playing a bigger role. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, I obviously, uh, I've taken up so much of your time. I just have like, I just have a, a couple more questions. I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, Al-Shabaab earlier in relationship to the breakdown of the potential breakdown of the Somali state uh, or the government or the armed forces. What is the current situation with al-shabaab um and is this i guess electoral crisis contributing to any sort of security breakdown that could benefit them um we can say yes it can contribute uh, the, the 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 action or the delaying action of uh, regime change or, or the people who are pushing for regime change can actually might be helpful for for al-shabaab but uh, i would like to mention for the benefits of your viewers that uh, the, there has been a force that was established through the African Union and the UN Security Council called AMISOM. Uh, you have more than uh, 20 countries 
uh, and there are more than 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 twenty thousand uh, 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 peace corps, let's say, who were supposed to fight Al Shabab. There are in Somalia more than twenty years. They didn't do anything. They didn't even move Al Shabab mm -hmm. from the capital Mogadishu. But when the government came back, uh, uh, and then the Somali army was established, a very strong Somali army. Now Al Shabab have been removed from all parts of Somalia. Only one region remained, which is Jubaland. And, 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 and who's there in Jubaland? Uh, a, a, a guy that is not even a Somali. The guy is actually came from Ethiopia. It was established uh, and he was, he was put uh, in Jubaland as a governor by the TPLF regime. And this guy is actually sitting there for 10 years and it's a well-known drug dealer, war crimes, war law. Uh, uh, he's the one who destroyed uh, uh, Jubaland environmental resource by, by burning the, the huge forest and turning it into charcoal, uh, 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 selling it to, to the Emirates for shisha. Uh, mm. uh, uh, so that guy is supported today, until today, by Kenya, by the corrupt government of uh, 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 the actual uh, uh, government of Kenya, uh, because also uh, Jubaland is on the, on, the, on the sea. So there is a lot of sugar, uh, a lot of uh, uh, many things coming on, and then, then the, there are high... Uh, general in the Kenyan army, as well the the high high level people in the Kenyan government who are involved, and then bringing it through Kenya. Uh, so it's a huge business, totally illicit business. There has been a lot of report that was made by the the, the UN. Everyone know what's going on, but everyone everyone is actually silenced because a lot of people prefer actually to keep their position uh, rather than tell the truth. Abdurrahman, Mohammed, Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us at Breakthrough News on Dispatches to try to help us understand the things that are happening in the War Horn of Africa. We really appreciate all the trouble you went through to make this interview possible. Vanya, I, I, I am actually the one who would like to thank you. Again, I would like to say tahiyya lil muqawama. And uh, uh, the Western actually have an agenda, very clear agenda, is to globalize the, actually their culture of death. And, and, and bombardment, and it's up to us actually to globalize Intifada everywhere. Thank you.